Blog Talk Radio. Alternative facts. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. At 12.07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, numerous unidentified objects of unknown intent and unknown origin were detected at high altitudes over multiple locations of Earth's outer space by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and these objects are presumed to be some form of controlled aircraft. It is not known if more of these aircraft will arrive or if they will attempt to enter Earth's atmosphere. United States citizens are encouraged to monitor local media outlets as more updates will follow as information becomes available. is transmitted at the request of the United States government. Attacks by the undead have been reported in several states across the country. The dead are rising from their graves and are attacking the human race. At this time, it is expected that more attacks of this nature will occur in several other states in the next few hours. The intent behind the attack is unknown at this time. He has been observed that a bike for exchange of fluids is a method of transmission. This is an extremely dangerous situation if they crave the taste of human flesh. It is not known whether this event will last for hours, days, or even longer. Stay calm, as authorities have been dispatched to deal with these creatures. An all-clear siren will be sounded when this situation is under control. Your host, Rodney, the Viking Shortridge, wants to give a big old shout out to the Facebook paranormal groups that allow us to post our shows on their pages and helping us to get the word out about all of our guests. If anyone would like to speak to Black Diamond Paranormal Society, BDPS, to discuss your paranormal questions or issues, go to our website at blackdiamondps.org or email blackdiamondps at yahoo.com. As always, our services are free. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. You can listen in by calling 516-387-1922, or you can go to the Vibe Radio Network website at blogtalkradio.com forward slash Vibe Radio Network. For deep within the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for listening to Within the Chaos. My name is Rodney Shortridge, and I'll be your host tonight. First off, I'd like to give a shout-out to my cousins up in Ohio, Jennifer and Joe Shortridge of 222 Paranormal. If you get a chance, check out their talk show. You can find them on Facebook under 222 Paranormal. Have your devices just randomly stopped working? Are you having IT trouble? 
Not to worry, Mead's PC Repair Shop can help. We also offer IT support too, including website hosting. We are now also offering full event management services. To find out more, contact our friendly customer service team who will gladly help in any situation. Just call 276-880-8900 or if you prefer, you can stop by our shop at 1089 St. Clair Street, Oakwood, Virginia, 24631 by appointment only or by visiting the website at meadspcshop.com for more information. Thank you. Well, howdy, everybody. I hope everybody's having a good week. We finally got a little bit of rain, so it's been, been quite dry here, but it's finally cooled down a little bit. So I hope everybody else is being cool because it has been hot, hot. Well, tonight, our special guest is author John Kirkendall. John is an international best-selling author. His new release book, Squatch Files reached the number one best-selling spot in three weeks on Amazon, and he is the new paranormal script and news writer for the Haunted Tours TV show, founder and president of the National and World Squatch Files Research Team, SFRT. He has been interviewed on a wide range of radio shows, seen on TV, and he is the author of Haunted America, do you believe and legends of the peak bigfoot 50 years later a paranormal encrypted investigator for more than 20 years he is uh, he has been a conference speaker featured author on hindsight enterprises so we're going to be talking about bigfoot tonight people so let's let's go ahead and see if we can get him on here Hello, John, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's it's an honor to have you on the show, sir. Hey, Rodney, can you hear me? Yeah. I hear uh, you loud and clear, sir. I just want to make sure this mic is working. Oh, okay. <laughs> so how are you doing? Uh, I, I'm doing fine today. Um, I got a little bit of a cough earlier I've been trying to get rid of, but hopefully it won't interrupt the uh, interview. But, but yeah, I'm doing okay. fine. That's good. That's good. Well, can can you tell everyone a little bit about you know about yourself and you know what got you into writing about Bigfoot and the paranormal? Well, yeah. I mean, ever since I was uh, probably a teenager, I was always uh, fascinated with the uh, Patterson Gimlin film because I've always been like a, this uh, monster buff, you know, when I was a kid. Um, and when I first saw the Patterson Gimlin film, that was the first true monster that that was actually to me was real. So instead of the monsters, you know, that you once you had under the bed, um, this was actually a real one to me. So I became very interested in uh, this creature that I was watching, you know, on TV. And so as I got older, I just tried to <clears throat> I tried to learn more about this, uh, what this thing was, because it's just fascinating. You know, then um, The Legend of Boggy Creek came out, and then that just put me over the cough, and I said, well, you know what? I think one day I'm going to go out and I'm going to look for these and see if they really exist. You know, because, you know, I would have my, my mom would, would tell me that these things were real. It was just something, you know, that they put on TV to scare little kids. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I decided that when I got older to, to look and find these myself. Uh, so that's when I started doing, you know, uh, probably in my late 20s. Uh, I started researching for scriptures, trying to find every place that I could think of. Uh, to look for them, you know. Uh, but now, you know, you got so many reports everywhere, you can just walk outside your door and find one, you know, uh, because they're just about in every state. Uh, but, yeah, I, I became fascinated with it, you know. Uh, it's like a, it became a passion of mine, and I just kept uh, 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 reading everything I could on Bigfoot. And, uh, now that's, that's what I've been doing for more than 20 years. Okay. Well, what what does it entail to uh, be a, a Bigfoot researcher? Like, is there any type of training that you got to go through, or, um, or classes or something? And I, I'm not saying it's trying to make it sound stupid or nothing. It's just, you know, <laughs> well, well, you know, I, there, I mean, there are training videos. Probably. I mean, there are there are, they they do put up these training videos. 
<clears throat> but me, you know, I was more or less self-taught. And then, you know, I, I learned by some trackers back in the day on how to track an animal, um, what to look for, um, and, you know, between bears and cougars and, 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 and coyotes and wolves. And then when the Bigfoot thing came up, uh, there was a friend of mine who was actually, his name is my name, his name is John, and he was a Bigfoot researcher himself, and I went out with him many times. And he just showed me the ropes on how to, you know, look and the signs to look for for these uh, Bigfoots and how to cast, you know, uh, tracks and, and what have you. So it was more of an on-the-job type learning thing at the time. But nowadays, people do put out these videos. Because uh, over years of, of doing this, people put out videos on how to uh, track uh, Bigfoots. Okay. Well, right. in your opinion, in your opinion, what's the best terrain uh, to look for a Bigfoot? Best terrain would be any type of, uh, uh, like, like you know, they, they like these deep wooded areas. They like the uh, the uh, shaded parts of the mountains. Uh, they like the, the parts of uh, streams and rivers, uh, gulches, uh, uh, creeks, things you know where there's a lot of water. Um, but uh, they like to be uh, so since they can be elusive, they like to be in the you know, most of them you know, like to be in the deep woods. But of course, they come out and whatever they want to come out in, you know, uh, <clears throat> they cross streets nowadays. Uh, but uh, mainly just really deep shaded woods uh, where there's a bunch of water. You, know, you find a water source, you, you will find, most likely find a big one, or at least hmm. what they leave behind. Well, I know where I live. I, li- I live in uh, Virginia uh, hmm. and uh, the southwestern part of the state that's near Kentucky, West Virginia, and Tennessee. And uh, about three years ago, for about this went on for like three years, three or four years. Uh, in the spring and in the fall, uh, about two or three o'clock in the morning, uh, you know how you leave your windows up and stuff. But yeah, I, I, I'd be up working and I could hear uh, what, what I've heard uh, people have recorded that that hooting and, and, and that squalling. And uh, I'd go outside on the porch to see if I can, you know, get a better listen and clear, be clear to listen to. And it would stop. And, and I, I talked to one big researcher and he said that, uh, that they know when somebody's out like that and there's normally more than one. Is, is that true? I mean, is that possible? Yeah. You know, that is very possible because, you know, they, you know, if you, you know, because over the years, you know, we, we've gone to uh, look at, you know, Bigfoot behavior and things that they do. And, and sometimes, you know, we don't quite know why they do the things that they do. But when you go up into the woods, remember, they're the masters of the forest. Okay. And they know you're there way before, you know, you even get into their area because you know, they, they can sense and smell you or, or even see you at nighttime. Um, but, yeah, they observe us like we want to observe them. And they like to learn. Actually, they like to learn from us. So yeah. So uh, when a person goes out at night, they're hearing something out, out in the woods. And if you stepped out on your porch, most likely it's going to be quiet because it's probably watching, you know, watching the property or whatever you have on your property that it wants. But yeah, that happens quite frequently. Well, see, I never found anything like on my property or anything. But uh, when I would go out, you know, after they calm, you know, stop squalling or hooting. Them, uh, then I'd hear coyotes, and then then mm-hmm. it's like the whole valley would light up with everybody's dogs barking. It's kind of creepy. Right. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, you always see this. You hear coyotes, and you hear and you hear wolves. You know, in areas where there's squatches. You know, uh, like they don't like our dogs. They're afraid of our dogs, but you know, they they somehow, you know, they they have this uh, know, this, this territorial thing with the, the wolves and coyotes. And they don't seem to bother each other, <clears throat> you know. But if you have your dog like out in the backyard and it starts barking, you know, um, it t- it tends to spook these uh, you know, squatches. Well, when you go, uh, when you get a report or someone calls or contacts you about, uh, you know, a Bigfoot claim, do, do you have any trouble like getting permission to investigate on their property? Do they give you any type of hassle about it or, or are they really open to let y'all come in and do what you need to do? Yeah, most of the time that they are. Um, you know, so Bigfoot's been, you know, um, 
you know, coming around more than, you know, just like the paranormal field has for many years. Uh, it, it, was, it took a long time for people to come out and talk about ghosts and talk about spirits or demons or things that, that, that they've said that they've seen or heard. Uh, uh, now, um, the same thing was happening with Bigfoot in the beginning. Uh, but now, uh, there's been so many sightings, and, and it's becoming, like, more and more frequently, almost on a daily basis, we're getting a sighting somewhere or someone is saying that, you know, uh, they're on the property, but the windows, they're going to the trash cans, um, or they're out there, uh, you know, bothering their, uh, or trying to eat their, their chickens or, or, or their sheep. Uh, but this is becoming to be a menace to the society that they, they believe when they come on their property. So I had a lady just last week came into uh, the store that I was at. I was at the Sasquatch Outpost, and the lady had came in, and she had sat down, and she was telling me and, and my friend Jim that uh, she believes that <clears throat> every night when she goes to sleep, the Sasquatch comes on the property and looks through her window. And it goes out in the back, and it, and it, it destroys her trash can. And tries to, to uh, you know, and she has them kind of like chained up so they don't go anywhere, these metal trash cans. And anyway, so it picks up and it's crushing her trash can. And every time she replaces her trash cans, you know, every couple of days, her trash cans are, are picked up and they're smashed on both sides. So she's asking, you know, can we come up there and we do something? Can we put out some cameras? Can we see what exactly this is that's coming on my property? Yeah, but most people, will, you know, if they're having an issue with a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot or something that they believe, even if it's not, you know, it could be something else, they'll more than happy to come on the property and spend, you know, a couple of nights out there. Okay. Well, are there any reports uh, lately or in the past of any uh, Bigfoot attacks where they've hurt someone or even killed anyone? Uh, you know, those are very rare. You know, if if a Sasquatch was to attack a person, right, that would be because that person either uh, came up on it like like suddenly, or the person is, or was showing some type of aggression. But Bigfoots, they have been known to attack in, in the past. Now, I mean, very very rarely though would a Bigfoot attack somebody because they're they run from them. They they talk to each other and you know like they, these things do, and, and they're very cautious of humans. You know, um, and, and I'm sure that the daddy's telling the juveniles, hey, if you see a demon, you know, you need to look. Um, because just the kind of the, the tools that we have that that they're afraid of, like our guns for one and our knives and, and these things that pepper sprays, these OC sprays and things that we use because they deserve a stop with force. So, uh, but most likely uh, a, a Bigfoot to attack someone only be because uh, the Bigfoot either is self-threatening or um, it was, you know, it could have been trapped somewhere by, you know, by humans and need to, to fight his way out. Um, but very rarely we hear about a soft Okay. Yeah, I know uh, a few years ago, gosh, it was back when I was in, 20, in my 20s, I was hunting. And uh, I walked around a corner in the woods and I, and I ran up onto a, a big one and a, a, a shorter one. And mm-hmm. I was probably, was probably a good uh, 60 feet apart. It's like I surprised them, they surprised me. And, and to me, it felt like I was standing there forever <laughs> before anybody made a move. And I and I just mm-hmm. just took a step back. And and then it they kind of took a step back. And then I took two more, and then they ran down the hill. And now I understand, <clears throat> like, hunters you know a lot of people ask why hunters doesn't kill one it, 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 it's hard to kill something that looks so human like yeah exactly yeah you know, and, I had, and that's the thing I, you know i had my rifle yeah. on me and i could have done that but I, I couldn't do it one i was too damn scared <laughs> you know even you know like like there are people like hey if i ever shoot one will even do any damage you know that's what a lot of people would think so a lot of them get even get afraid to shoot it because, like, if you shoot uh, a grizzly bear, say with a nine millimeter, it's just going to piss it off and it's going to keep on coming at you. You know, if yeah. someone has a nine millimeter, you know, a big squash like that, you know, five six hundred pounds, you know, really thick skin, you know, and, and hair. If you shoot it and if you don't kill it, it's going to kill you then at, at that point because now you're showing that sign of aggression. Um, yeah. So yeah, a lot of people are afraid to even shoot one, but like, I would never shoot one, even if you know. I'd let it kill me first, probably, but I don't. I don't think I would ever shoot one. 
Yeah, I, 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 I don't even go out with a gun. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, was, I was terrified when I came back home. I, I, I mean, I was weak kneed and, and when, you know, I was telling people, they're like, oh, oh man, you seen a bear. I'm like, no, that wasn't no mm-hmm. damn bear. <laughs> but, yeah, that's the thing. We know what bears look like. I mean, I've seen bears all my life. But when you come across a squat, if you've never seen one, then now you're looking at that and you're going like, what? That's right. You know, because you don't know what you're looking at. If it was a bear, I would know right away it was a bear. Even from right. a distance, I would know it was a bear. And I've walked up so, many of yeah. them. Yeah. And, and, you know, you just chew or holler or something and they'll run away. And, you know, when yeah. you're looking at something that's standing upright, you know, and looking dead at you and you can see its expressions in its face, yeah, yeah you, it, it's just it's just hard to put it into words. Yes, that it is. Because seeing something like that or seeing one of these for your first time, it's it's very, like, shocking, you know. Because people, you know, and they go, you know, I, I really like to see one, you know. But when you first see one, it, it's like, wow, it's breathtaking. It's just you, you don't know what, what to, you know, what to say, what what to do. You, you please it in fear because it's so large. Uh, and, and you just look at this thing knowing that it could, it could kill you if it wanted to, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a very scary to look at, you know, for your first time. But after you've been out there and you, you've seen them over, over many years, you know, uh, they become, you know, like a, like to me, they become like you know, or like a bear just walking in the woods, um, because you see them quite frequently. Well, when was the first time you actually had an encounter where you seen uh, seen one for the first time? Ten years ago, it was the first time I ever saw one, and that was that was coming out of a black forest out here in Colorado. Well, actually, I wasn't even on a, uh, a Sasquatch investigation at that time. I was on a paranormal investigation because I was uh, doing a book on the haunting of the Black Forest. And we were leaving <clears throat> at about uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, and we were driving down the highway. We got about two miles down. And as we are driving, there's uh, the side of the mountain, there's a, a few houses up, up there. And, but the, the, the mountain kind of goes on an incline, like at a 45-degree angle. <clears throat> so we're driving down this highway, and all of a sudden, but I, I think what happened was that when the, this – the squatch was coming, it was running down the hill. And it kind of met my car at the same time, and it couldn't stop in time, so it jumped over my car across the highway about 20 feet and, and broke in between two big trees. And these two big trees just broke right on over, and it lands and just runs off. But I got a, I got a good look at it. You know, it was, it, this was a big one. It had to be about you know, nine feet tall, probably weighed about close to 700 pounds. And uh, that's the first time my wife ever saw one, too. Of course, she doesn't want to believe that she saw it. But, but uh, yeah, and that was the first time I ever saw one. Um, and that just changed my life at that particular point because now I said to myself, now I've seen it. I can't believe what I just saw, but I just saw it. And it changes your life at, at that point. <coughs> Excuse me. And at that point, you know, I just wanted to, uh, now I wanted to go even deeper into this, you know. Because now I know they exist. You know, I mean, people will say, oh, it doesn't exist. Well, do the research and find out for yourself. Because, you know, you're sitting at home, never done any research. How do you know they exist? That's just, a, that's just your opinion that they don't exist. When you've seen them and know that you've seen them, come face-to-face with them, or within a few feet of them, you know, now you become a believer. You know? And I had my doubts. Believe me, I had my doubts for, for, for a while until I saw this for, my, for myself. When I first saw this, uh, yeah, now, now I am a little bit too believer at that point. Um, you know, but you know, most people, you know, after research, they just see what these things leave behind. You know, but to see a soft squash is normally going to be by chance. Um, but there are times, though, there's there's these certain squashes that we have here in Colorado that just let you see them. Mm-hmm. You know, and and there's a few of them up there in the mountains when you go up in there. If in the areas that we go into, they don't mind if you're, you know, looking at them from a distance. Um, right. But, uh, uh, yeah, but they're very fascinating to look at, you know, and, and to observe and, and look at what they do. Um, but, you know, but if you do, like if you move in a weird way or you make some kind of like a any kind of loud noise or run away, um, but normally they'll just let you look at them. Well, I agree. It's, they they are fascinating, and 
and it, it is a life changing moment when you see one up close. I will testify to that. Because it, it, you know, it, I, I know what I saw, and I know what no damn bear, and <laughs> and <clears throat> when you when you see their face, to me that was the most the most intriguing thing was just that the the expressions of the face that it was so human like, and I knew that. I needed to back the hell up because I was in the wrong spot at the wrong time. <laughs> well, h- how do they communicate? Uh, you know, it, it, I know it talked about the sounds and the grunts and the hollering. Is that a form a form of communication? And I know some there are some reports that uh, people have actually heard, uh, like heard them speaking like uh, like a language. I think he, I think he dropped a call. <laughs> Let me see if I can uh, see if he'll call back. And till then, I'll go ahead and take a oh shoot. Sorry about these pop ups. Let's see here. We'll be right back. Fandom Fest 2019 is hosted and sponsored by Black Diamond Paranormal Society, Blog Talk Radio within the Chaos and Elk Garden School Community Ministry. The Phantom Fest is geared for the like-minded and enthusiasts and researchers in the fields of the paranormal, UFOs, cryptozoology, comics, horror films, gamers, cosplay, metaphysical, spiritual, artists, authors, ancient civilizations, tattoo artists, unexplained mysteries, superheroes, FX horror artists, steampunk, costume contest, sci-fi and so much more. The Fest offers a unique and interesting outlook on the abnormal. The Phantom Fest will be held on November 2, 2019 at the Russell County Conference Center 139, Highland Drive, Lebanon, Virginia. Starting at 10 a.m. and going to 6 p.m. tickets are $7 per person, ages 0 to 6 are free. Four tickets can be reduced to $5 per person with two non-perishable food items to be donated to the Elk Garden School Community Ministry to help families during the Thanksgiving season. Any non-perishable food donations will be happily received. Also, we will have a free costume contest for all ages. Guest speakers, returning this year, Bill and Chris Reap of Reap Investigations, giant researcher Heather Arnold. New to this year's Phantom Fest guest speakers, Dave Spinks, Ron Whitehead, Jake Five, Chad Zumwalt and Whitney Benson. Amy Green, Barry Gaunt, Cosplay Bridget Baker, CNC Paranormal Investigations, Dennis Estlock, Georges Girls Heather Taylor and Nika Taylor, Haunted MD Donald Molnar, Lucky Bel Camino, Michelle Wagner, and Rebecca Smoot. Special appearances by Cosplay Bridget Baker, Martial Arts Christian Yaya Thompson and Token Nihilist Cosplay, Arthur Stump, Grace and Lehman, Raphael Bertiz and the Whiteville Ghostbusters. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. We had a little <laughs> drunk call. Or yeah, wow. at, at, you're, you, you said your phone just shut off. Yeah, it just like completely like went dead, and I, and I was going hello, and I was pushing the buttons, and nothing was happening. So then I, but then I pushed it again, and it turned itself back on, and, and it's like totally just went off. I never had that do that before. It was kind of strange. Well, I've had a couple of calls where people have called in and their phones have done something similar to that. And they're like, what's going on here? The government trying to keep me from talking to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was, that was weird. Yeah, because I've done a lot of radio shows, but this is the first time my phone ever, like, shut off on me. Oh, oh wow. Well, that okay. makes me feel special. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but what I was, uh, I don't know if you heard what I was asking, but uh, uh, as far as the the sounds that they make, uh, the knocking, uh, is that some type of form of communication or warning? And also, I've had other, uh, I've read that other researchers have actually heard them speaking like a language. Yes, yes, definitely. Actually, some people in Canada have been uh, working uh, with them on speaking different languages. And also, they've had it recorded actually making vocalizations of human voices. Uh, because, see, I believe, too, if 
Oh, what's that? Uh, if uh, if they're part part in like a if they're human subspecies and have have human DNA in them, you know, uh, they should have some type of human vocal resolution. Because if they can make a whooping sound that has a P at the end of it, then that means they got lips and they got, you know, they, they got good vocalization. If they can make P, P, you know, because you got to make these P sounds and these whoop sounds. Um, but uh, yeah, these these uh, squatches make different types of, uh, uh, of noises to communicate, and they have their own language. It's 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 a strange type of language, but they understand it. Um, and yeah, but mostly you know you'll hear the whooping sound. And uh, we don't know exactly, you know, the, like the Morse code of the whooping sounds, but that's, that's definitely a way that they communicate with each other. Because you'll hear a whoop one place, and then you'll hear it again in a different place. And then you'll hear it again in another place, and then sometimes it gets really consistent. And I don't know if it's a Morse code type of thing that they do there, they whoop, but yeah, they definitely make different sounds to communicate. But uh, okay. I, I know that they, they are, they are uh, uh, people are working um, on a, uh, Recording their uh, sounds of human, like uh, human vocalizations, human words, and, you know, like saying saying names of uh, people. Okay. Well, where do you think they come from? Um, I mean, do you, do you think that they're possibly like a branch from the human tree, or possibly a missing link to humans? Well, see, the thing about that, there's different theories on that, and, and um, like I. Like I had one of my books, Nova Ketchum did a five-year DNA study uh, that they believe to be known uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch DNA. And it was sent to different laboratories and different laboratories that came back with, with results on the DNA studies that they've done over the years. And what what was believed to be, say, in 2009, was it was, it was believed to be that uh, uh, Sasquatch is human hybrid, a human subspecies, and about 15,000 years ago, a, a Neanderthal, back in the day, had a sex with an unknown, well, today it's an unknown primate, but some type of primate back in that time. Because over the years, our genome systems changed, we evolved into something different. But back then, uh, it was still close enough match to where, uh, say, a, a, an ape or a gorilla or some type of uh, chimpanzee or whatever um, would be able to mate with uh, a human and still come out, you know, and come out with babies, you know, back in, back in that time. So that's mm-hmm. what the DNA showed them to believe because it was mixed with human and today is an unknown primate because the primate today that whatever it was back then, there's no descendants of that today. So we can't get a clear picture on what that primate is that it was <clears throat> that uh, it's mixed with. Um, but that's the belief. But now there's different theories out there now today. You know, people think that, you know, they come from UFOs out of space, other planets. Um, you know, they think they come through portals to another time. Um, they think aliens dropped them off here. Uh, it's, it's just whatever, you know, you want to believe because there's really not one concrete theory on these things because we don't actually have um, a specimen. You know exactly, you know, you know where these things came from. But the closest thing that we can find out now is the DNA that was supposedly is supposed to um, surface back in 2009. That these things are definitely human subspecies, and, and about, they came out about 15,000 years ago. And you know, over over the you know all these years, they just you know evolved and got you know, more and more and more. Um, and now they're being seen all over the world. So. Um, you know, just within the last uh, 15, 20 years, you know, there's been the, the sightings of uh, quadruple, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So we don't know if, if, if that's actually what people are seeing, but when every state here in the United States has had a soft sports uh, town or a site. Wow. Well, why do you think there's uh, that no one's been able to find any remains, you know, uh, as far as the bone? <laughs> that's the you know, that's the biggest question because, you know, if, like, again, if they're, if they got any type of human intelligence, they take their dead and bury their dead, probably bury their dead in caves or they bury their dead somewhere high up in the mountains where we can't even get to or would even think about going to. I'm sure they have Bigfoot graveyards. Um, 
because you know if your if your daughter or your son or your wife was was, was died or was laid on the floor dead, you wouldn't leave them there. If you had human emotions, would we? No, we, we wouldn't. So if they have any type of human emotions in them or any type of, uh, of human traits in them, which they do, but but like feeling wise, uh, they would they would uh, bury their dead. You know, just like we do. And I'm sure that they have places that uh, we can't find them. But mm-hmm. I'm sure people. I mean, people say that they, they, they found Bigfoot graveyards, but uh, but have they really, you know? We did, people right. would pick them up and see if there was bones under them. No one's ever really came up. But that's what I believe that they do. They just take your dead and bury them like we did. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with that. Well, when, you, when you're doing your uh, research when you're out in the field, what, what type of equipment do you use? Mm. Well, Remember what I take out with me, like crazy people do. You take out thermal imaging cameras, you take out night vision cameras, you take out the uh, uh, video, different types of video cameras. You take out casting powders, you take out, uh, take out. Uh, I've got a baseball bat for your wood knocks. I take out uh, measuring tapes. Um, I'll take out uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, my. Um, well, it just depends on what I'm doing, but mostly my 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 Canon cameras. Uh, I take out. Uh, actually, I have now. I have a, a new tool that I use now. I I have a uh, bullhorn that, and on my phone, I have all the Sasquatch sounds that have been recorded, and I play mm-hmm. these sounds through my bullhorn, and it echoes all through the mountains. It's really cool, and I get good responses back from it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just basic stuff that you go out. You know, you go out there with. You know, you do the binoculars. Um, you know, it just depends on, you know, what you do in daytime or nighttime. Or, um, but I just take out a variety of different things depending on where I'm going and what I'm doing. But I just tried this uh, um, bullhorn uh, last week, this last weekend, and I uh, got some pretty good responses from that. Um, so I so I'm, actually, I'm still going over some of the video now. Uh, but everyone's hearing all, all the wolfing and screaming sounds that they were making. Afterwards, and I take a parabolic dish. I'll use that like I used last weekend. But yeah, but so just a variety of different things depending on where you're going and what you're doing. Now, do you do you normally get a uh, uh, like a good reply back? Uh, uh, like they're trying to communicate with you? Yeah, because the other night we got the whooping sounds again. You know, and those whooping. Sounds that, that they're making are they, that's the start of their communication because you're probably thinking what does that to do with just hearing because I'm having see when I'm doing sounds through through this app and I'm putting it over a bullhorn and they're hearing it they're thinking what the hell is that you know because <laughs> they haven't heard this before in this area right what kind of sasquatch is that you know mm-hmm. uh, because say if you take a sound of a yeti you know, and you play it out in the forest of, 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 of where we're at here, uh, and they hear a Yeti sound, they're going to go, what is that, right? So when they started whooping, it became more consistent between between them. They were just whooping, whooping. That's was playing this this uh, sound, these different sounds. And they were talking to each other like they didn't know what to think about it. Well, should we go check it out or what? You know, where's that coming from? Because when, when you play it, I mean, it just echoes to Anyway, I think some of the other campers and people that were out there were hearing it too. I was probably scaring them, but it was it was pretty cool because they make out a scream. Uh, actually, it was kind of like a pig squealing type of thing, um, and that came after the whooping sound. Um, but yeah, I think they were trying to figure out that night what it was, and they, they, they were talking, or, to, or at least they were trying to talk to whatever was out there because they were carrying the whooping sounds around the mountain area because it's crazy. Uh, but it was it was pretty interesting that uh, they reacted to these sounds, and I don't really think that they knew what they were, um, but or at least what kind of squats like the new squats that came and moved in or something. Um, but yeah, it was kind of funny at, at the same time, you know, because I knew that we were disturbing them because they didn't want to think. You know, then we you know we got uh, you know we're hearing things out there walking. You're, you're hearing the bite people walk at night. You know, you're hearing the snapping of the branches through walking. Um, and 
I think in some of the photographs, I still got a lot more. I took a lot of photographs. Uh, we, we got a couple, may have a couple of faces uh, in the photographs. Um, but then again, I got some strange anomalies too at the time I was taking some photos. And I don't know what they are because I never got these before taking pictures out in the woods. Um, so I got to see exactly what these things were too. Um, but yeah, th yeah, but they were they were definitely uh, kind of confused the other night. I think I confused them when I played this, uh, these uh, vocalizations. Well, since you mentioned the Yeti, what what are the different types of uh, uh, Bigfoot species that uh, people are studying around the world? Well, you know, the thing about that is that we don't know exactly uh, what uh, species of Sasquatch. I mean, we they have different names for them, but we really mm -hmm. don't know what kind of species that they are 100% you know, um, because if you have the Yeti like up in Nepal or up in the Himalayas and stuff like that, uh, it's totally, it's totally, totally different than a, a Bigfoot, right? So that's its own different type of species. We really don't even know what kind of species it is. Um, yeah. But it's similar to the Bigfoot, but it's not really uh, a Bigfoot. It's, 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 uh, we don't really don't know exactly. You know, um, that's that's what you know. The, the thing is that we really want to find out is what exactly these are. So you have to, you would actually have to get samples from every single species or every single Sasquatch known, you know, that we have out there. You get samples of each one of them and run, you know, a DNA test on every single one of them. You know, so mm -hmm. like the Yowie in Australia, you know, uh, the skunk apes, you know, are. Just different, uh, the almas, you know, out in Asia, you know, uh, different things. We have to, to 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 study the DNA in order to get a complete picture of exactly what kind of species they are. So. What why, why do you think it's so hard? I mean, because this has been a this is a worldwide uh, thing that's going on. Why do you think that no one, especially around the world, has been able to either capture one or or find, you know, rem the remains or any any solid proof other than, you know, eyewitness photographs, videos, and so forth. Well, you are know, they, people, you know if you want to, yeah, if you understand, you know, crosswatches for one, uh, they, they do, you know, like I said, they've had thousands of years to, to master the, you know, being elusive. Um, and, and of course, we don't have the, the, the quickness, the speed, uh, the, the strength, the, the endurance that they have in the woods. Um, you know, you have, you know, like if you watch mountain monsters and stuff like that, where they set these traps up to to catch these things. Um, but that's pretty much just for TV because they really don't catch these things. Um, but they, but they're because they're so cautious of humans, right? And they they're, they're, they set the forest up. Make sure that they can camouflage themselves. Uh, that when they walk, they they they'll, they'll clear their own paths to walk. They'll they'll parallel human uh, trails. Um, they're they're very um, you know like like they'll set up these um, uh, these uh, like like uh, I don't know, like like bends and stuff along along the uh, paths of roads that they can, if they're walking that they can hide behind. Um, they hiding. We believe that they hiding caves, you know. Um, but uh, you know, they use paths and they use uh, parts of the forest that we would never use, you know. Because if we're, if we're walking in the forest, most people when they're walking in the forest is going to use a trail. If they can find a trail to, to go off into, they don't do that. They totally go off grid in the forest. Um, and it's just like if, if if I'm walking into your house, I wouldn't know where to go to your bathroom. So I'd have to ask you where the bathroom is. And if we walk into the forest, we have no clue where they're going to be at. And look how big the forest is. And they've got millions and like 750 million square miles of forest out there. You know? And us to be able to walk into the forest and try and find these, you know, these uh, creatures is about to be impossible. Because they know exactly where to go, they've been there for thousands of years. You know, um, they know the woods. You know, uh, we don't. It's like if you go to a place you've never been to before. You know, just gonna walk up into the woods. You're never gonna find these things. But they know how to be elusive. They don't. They they've mastered that. You know, 
and they have a camouflage to them, you know, and they can camouflage themselves in the woods, and they make sure they stay a great distance from us when they're observing us. Um, because when we walk out there, believe me, they can smell us. Mm-hmm. They know we're there, so they're going to do everything that they can, you know, because if they actually, some of them actually, when they make these trails, they'll, they'll clear the branches, they'll clear the brush, all these trails, so when they walk down them, it's quiet, so they can walk quiet because they got flat feet, you know, and so they walk kind of quietly down these trails, and they'll follow you. Sometimes you don't even, from watching most of the time, you don't even know that they're following you. They're observing what you're doing. Um, and, and, and just the way that these things are, they just, they're, they've mastered this over thousands of years and how to be elusive. There's no way I could just walk into a forest and, and go find a spot, you know. Um, if it's like a, like a, a new place that I had, had, had went to, um, but if it's a place maybe I've been going to for a long time, I might have a you know notion of where I can find them at because of the evidence that we behind it. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd probably go sit and hang out there, you know, for days on end, and maybe I come across one or two of them, you know, that that might come across the, the path that, that I'm on. Because when I go out there, I, I like to try to find out where the tracks are, um, where all the big tree breaks are, you know, um, where all the bends in the trees are, and um, and somewhere by some water, so I'll, I'll go down there and I'll sit in their area and kind of like get between them and where they want to go. Like if I see a, a trail that they'll be like they've made or, or they're using, now I look for their trails and I go out there. Like if you find a, a human trail, you're probably going to find a soft spot trail not too far. So I'll go out and I'll try and find a place that they've been walking because they'll clear trees seven, eight feet above them. They'll break the branches off and they'll make a, a good path for them to walk. And that way, when they're walking out there, you know, they're not running into these things. So they can, they can walk and, and observe us as we're out there. So I go out there and look, and I'll sit, and I'll sit right in between that, and hopefully that one of them, you know, will you know, throw a rock at me or a pine cone or something, or yell at me to get out of their, their territory. Hmm. But, yeah, they're, they're just they're just mashing their, that, that elusiveness in the forest over thousands of years. There's no way to go out there and play with them because there's just no way. Mm-hmm. Well, where you're talking about where they've been in and breaking branches and the trees, do they leave like, do they have like territorial markers? Have you found any evidence yeah. that they're yeah. marking their territory? Yeah. Oh, definitely. And a lot of those are by the trees. You know, they'll take the they'll take the uh, trees and they'll braid. They, I don't saw trees that were braided. You know, like I twig the trees, branches that mm-hmm. go off the trees. So I've been braided, X and braided. Uh, so they know that they're coming across a, a human trail. Then they bite by human trails. Um, and then they also have uh, certain sizes of exits that they do in the trees. And a lot of these are along the trail lines or along the food line or the waterways, where they, how they go to get to the water. Um, and this is the way I go to avoid the humans. I go this way, so they have to make these exits in the forest. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes, too, you, you walk down uh, paths and you'll see trees that are off from one side of the of the trail to the other side of the trail and put together um, for some reason we don't even know why that is um, but yeah they do make a lot of markers out there and I come across a lot of them a lot of them just telling them where to go and what to avoid by the sizes of them and the way that they put them and they put them in you know some of them in different different ways you know just like when um, you have uh, you go out into the forest and you see a den a big den has been made and they have all of the trees that are laid down on the ground and they're crossing each other and they're crossing each other and they're up off the ground about six inches and some are even up about a foot and we never really knew why they did that now now we know why that they do it it's because what they're doing is they're making speed bumps in the forest and either that's either because that's slow down their prey when when deers come across this stuff they have to walk slowly to go over it or it's so that uh when you know we go to follow them you know we can't follow them Makes it harder for us to follow them. So this is like a path that they use, like an escape plan type thing, that they can easily get over it, and we can, or something chasing them can. But uh, we know that uh, now that uh, there's speed bumps that they use for different reasons too to slow things down in the forest. Well, it sounds to me like that they, for these thousands of years, that they've realized that humans are their enemy. Is that clear to say? Mm-hmm. No, I mean, they probably believe that we're their enemy. But, I mean, I mean, you have the people out there that post the guns. They're out there. They want to shoot these. They want to hunt them. But, you know, 
see, look, you're looking at an apex predator. The only thing that they have to fear is man. You know, that's it. That's all they have to fear out in this wood is man. And that's why, you know, they don't they don't like to be around us. They don't like us to see them because when they observe us, they serve us up to hunt people. And right. they see these things that we use to hunt and kill. They they know that. They know what these things do. It makes them afraid. And then you have everybody out target shooting out in the woods, constantly shooting. Where we were at, matter of fact, there was a, uh, about a half a mile from where I was at. I was walking through there, and there was a uh, – a, a little shooting range made up, and there was like a whole pile of 20 gauge, 12 gauge, 30 uh, odd six uh, shells and stuff on the ground, shooting into the uh, the mountain area. You know, and this is actually in the same area where I was hearing these whooping sounds the night before, the following night. Yeah, but yeah, but but they like to see the tools that we use. They like to learn from us as much as we want to learn from them because they want to know what to avoid and what not to avoid. You know, basically, but when you see uh, people out there shooting constantly and shooting deer or shooting elk or or uh, even shooting bears or what have you, and they see this, yeah, it makes them afraid, very afraid. And this has been happening for millions, I mean, for, for hundreds of years, at least 200 years, you know, that uh, um, that we've been, you know, shooting with arrows and, and, and killing animals with arrows and then with bows and, and then, uh, you know, guns and um and, you know, and they pass, you know, like, you know, the, the things pass on to each, you know, squatch over the years. And, and then the, the older ones tell the younger ones, hey, look, this is what you do, this is what you don't do when humans come around. And that's why when they see us, they constantly just start running because they believe that we're out there to hunt them because they see right. us as hunters. Well, have, have you ever been on a, a, a investigation where that? You've been scared, you know, maybe to the point you're like, oh. <laughs> we got to get one out here. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You, you, you haven't, I never told you the story, did I? Uh, uh-uh. About, uh, a couple of, couple of years ago. Now, this is a, I, I've told quite a few people the story. I did it on a couple of radio shows. But uh, this was a very strange, um, uh, well, well, I was actually I was researching because I had found some, I was, I was like way off grid in the woods. I was going to a place called Lost Pond, and I heard uh, of two known Sasquatches that you know, frequent the area. Well, I was there four months prior to what I'm fixing to tell you, but the four, when I was there four months prior, it was in the snowy season. And me uh, and one of my friends had found the, the pond that they drank out of and, and, and what have you. But anyway, on the other side of this pond, there's this big, long trail that goes back probably about three or four miles. And as we're approaching the pond, uh, I didn't notice what was on the other side of the pond, so I had made it kind of like made left and put up a little bit higher, uh, higher part of the, of, the, of the ground there. And as I was walking up this little hill, I went to my right because I wanted to see on the other side of the pond. Well, as I'm looking, I see all these tracks. And these tracks are, like, going back quite a way. So, wow, so it was pretty interesting. So I went over there, and I'm looking at these tracks, and I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Um, now, what I do, there's a friend of mine, one of the rangers up there, and what I do is I go in there and I look at all the bear tracks that they have, all the all the, all the the casts that they've made. I like, you know, what kind of tracks are in the area. Well, these were nothing like that. They had very small bears there, very small bear, bear footprints. Well, these prints, the ones that we came across, were 18 inches long. They were six inches wide, and, and they went down into the snow about almost seven, eight inches deep. And they were spaced off at about five and a half feet apart. And it was, it was like one in front of the other, you know, because Bigfoot's like to put one in front of the other so they can go down narrow trails. Um, mm-hmm. And this is exactly what this was. It was one foot in front of the other, like straight, almost like in a straight line. Um, and so when I was looking at this, I'm thinking, this, this has got to be one of these squatches, right? So I followed the, the trail back for a little while, and it just kept like it was never ending. But I got to the point where I didn't want to go, go any farther back there. So uh, I went ahead and I photographed and documented everything. And then uh, after we, we found a few more of their dens, we went and we left, but we returned four months later. Now, this is the, the weird part. Because I never thought, you know, people during that time people were telling, talking to me about interdimensional bigfoots and squatches and 
how they cloak themselves and things like that, right? Well, I never really thought too much about that, you know, uh, until this one incident. I took my friend Aaron with me, and we went back down again to this pond. It was dry season. And I said, Aaron, I said, I told him I had what I had found uh, four months previous. And, of course, after walking down there, new dens had been made. And uh, things that humans couldn't do, they'd taken, you know, 2,000-pound uh, trees and, and pulling them all the way up with these rock faces and making making uh, dens out of them, putting branches around it to make it dens. Uh, but anyway, so when we got down to this lake, I said, hey, look, I'm going to walk on the other side of the lake because the last time I was there, I really didn't go down there um, because I, I was kind of like spooked out because these, these if, if you see these prints, they're, they're kind of intimidating. So I told him, I said, I'm going to walk down there this time. And uh, actually, I had a guy with me with, with a film camera. He was filming and uh, to see exactly what was down. So it's okay. Let's go, man. I'll, I'll, I'm game. So we started walking down this trail. We got down there probably about a half a mile. And I stopped because I saw this big, humongous print on the side of the tr- this This trail is probably about five feet wide, and the dirt goes up on each side. So um, so when I was walking, on the left of me, I saw this big print. And I saw it probably, probably from about uh, 20 yards. That's how, how big it, I think that it was. Uh, so... Me and Aaron walked over there and looked at this print, and I could not believe it, man. I go, now I know the tracks in this area that this was shown to me, and I go into my little, my little photographs of tracks, and these are other tracks that are out here or wherever they're recorded out here. And so this print was, um, God, it was, it was 15, I think, inches long, and it was like almost seven inches wide. And I had Aaron, I didn't have my measuring tape at the time, I don't know why, but anyway, so but Aaron had a 13 inch foot, so I had him put his foot next to it. And it was bigger than his foot, a lot bigger than his foot. And so I turned and I looked behind me to see where this was coming from. So it had to come down this trail up, up this part of, part of the mountain area here, this brush area, come down and make one step over it because there's only one foot. There. So, it, it, so it stepped over at least five, five and a half feet when it made when it stepped right there on the edge of that trail. Um, so... I looked at Aaron and I said, well, I said, why don't we just follow the way this track is going? He said, we could find more or, or come up, you know, maybe we could find more dims. And he said, okay, let's do it. Well, my guy who was filming, he says, nah, he says, I'm going to stay right here. I can I can zoom in and catch you guys. I mean, I don't want to go down there. All right, whatever. So we stayed there. So we, we went uh, the way that this track was going. Walked in there about 30 yards. We came across a small creek. And, uh, Okay, well, that probably is where it was going. This is a drink. And so we stopped there for a minute. We're kind of looking around. And next thing you know, you start hearing this crunching, loud walking sound, like like it was like right next to you. And I thought my camera guy was walking towards us, you know, from the back of me. So I turned around and no, oh, he's back on the trail and, and I'm looking at Aaron. I go, You're hearing that, right? He said, Yeah, I'm hearing that. And my guy out in the trail says, Yeah, I'm hearing that too. All right. So we're looking around, we're looking up in the trees and, and, and we're like dead still. Okay, now it's getting louder. It's getting like a, it's a bike through the walk. It's like really crunchy. One step after the other. And it's like something's like fixing a jump on you, but it's not there. I thought there might have been a bear somewhere. So I'm looking out, so I don't see any bears. I don't see no bears. I don't see anything whatsoever. You know, so Aaron's standing, facing me, and I'm facing him. And he's looking at me, and this stuff's just getting louder and louder and louder. Now I start looking on the ground to see if I can see things walking that aren't there. Because if you if you were if you were standing there, and someone come walking up to you and starts like jumping really loud next to you, that's how loud this. But we can't oh, wow. see anything, and we don't understand why we can't see anything, but we hear this crunchy, loud, bam, bam, stomping sound, you know. And he, he looked at me again, and, and, and I told him, I said, hey, look behind me. Is there anything behind me? So I swear there's something going to jump on me. He looks behind me. He goes, no, there's nothing behind you. I said, there's nothing behind you either. Where's this coming from? You know, now you, you get this sense of fear in you because now we, we're hearing this, and, and it's getting consistent, you know. How can we not see what we're what we're hearing? It's so loud, you know. 
And he goes, man, what do we do? You know, and I, I'm, so I'm afraid to move. You know, because if we move, then I'm, I'm thinking something's going to jump on me. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, next thing you know, the stomping just, it, 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 we're walking in and just completely stopped. And then we're looking at each other again. What the hell was that? Well, we didn't know what the hell that was. Well, he was carrying this big ass stick, and he decides that he wants to make some locks on the tree. And at that point, I'm I got freaked out by that. I said, "Don't knock on the tree, man. I don't whatever that was. I don't want to come back, right? <laughs> don't do it. You know what does he do? No, I, I got to do it, man. I just got to do it. So he takes this stick and he bangs on the tree a few times. Oh shit! And I put my head down. I'm going, oh, man, we're going to die now. Now, now he's going to bring his thing back, we're going to die. That's what I'm thinking. So when he does that, you know, he didn't hear anything. But, okay, can we go now? Are, are you happy? You know, no, not one more time, one more time. You know? So he <laughs> bangs on the tree again a couple, few times, put the stick down. And sure enough, off to uh, his right, my left, you hear some knocking across the, the creek just into some of the, the wooded area. We hear some knocking over there. And so I turn in, I look, but we're not seeing anything. And I said, okay, dude, that's it. I said, we're, we're out of here. You know, and <laughs> as soon as he took one step forward, you hear this guttural growl come across the forest, across his face, across my face, you know, and really loud, like it echoed. And that was it. So, we just turned around. My camera guy had already started running up the trail when we had turned around because he had heard it too. And we said, that's it. So we start running. We got to get the hell out of here up the trail. And as soon as we get to the pond, we make the left-hand turn. Now we have to go upwards. And it takes, I mean, it takes about, the, walking it, it takes about 40 minutes to get out of this, this, this part of the woods that we were in. And I'm looking up that trail, so there's no way I'm going to run this trail. You know, so I kind of like try to slow, you know, like a slow track, slow fast pace of walking up this trail. And as we're doing that, you hear it snapping coming on our right, something's walking. And so we stop real quick, and Aaron's pointing over, did you just hear that? You hear this thing walking? I said, yeah, and then we're looking to our right, and, and we don't see anything again. But you can hear it walking. So we start walking up again, and then on our left-hand side, and in the brush, in the fourth part, uh, it's like, I mean, it really wasn't that thick because you could see through the trees. But you hear this snapping, walking, snapping, walking on the left side. Now we're really freaked out because whatever it was that we, we heard back there, now it's happening up here and it's following us, you know. So, yeah, all this time that we were down in this little canyon area of the woods, we thought we were fixing to die. So I think we would jump on You know, we're, we're just fixing it. We, we didn't know. We didn't, we didn't know what to think. But it was so scary. Because when you're hearing something, because it was intimidating, because that sound was so intimidating, you know, I, I just, like, it was like I was in a horror movie, like the Fear of the Woods or something like that, Cabin in the Woods or something. But it, it was really, really, you know, crazy to hear this, but you do not see it. So if the Sasquatch wanted to be elusive, I mean, it was super elusive, because you can do all that, and I can't see it. You know, they're, they're, what's wrong with that picture, you know? There's, I don't know if it was something supernatural, something paranormal about it, but it was the craziest thing I've ever thought of. And then when I got back up on the top of the trail, I'm sitting down on my truck. I'm thinking, you know, what people were telling me about, you know, these things can cloak themselves. You know, they're they're interdimensional. You know, they can do certain things like that. And then it got me thinking. I said, well, maybe that's what I just experienced. Because if you can do this, and I can't hear you, and I can't, I mean, I can't see you, but I can hear you right next to me, I mean, there's got to be something else to this. So, yeah, so then I got to thinking about uh, uh, cloaking and interdimensional, so I started researching that, you know. But what I think uh, people are catching on their film when they're, when they're seeing these uh, Sasquatches in the woods, um, but they look like they're cloaked, I think they're seeing Sasquatch apparitions is what they're seeing. You know, I don't think they're seeing cloaked Sasquatches. I just think they're apparitions of them, because I've seen so many photos of a Sasquatch, but it's in a, um, a spirit form. Mm-hmm. Because, of course, over the years, Sasquatches have died in the woods, and their spirits are going to still be walking in the woods, so I believe that's what they're catching on their, on their, 
photos, you know, and actually cloaking Sasquatches. <laughs> but yeah, but that was a scary situation for me. And you know, I have never been back there since. <laughs> I, and I, and I used to, but I used to go up, but I used to go up here frequently because there's a, you get a lot of evidence up there, you know. And um, but after that old deal, I refused to go back there. That's how much it terrified me to go down there, you know. And I, and that's what, you know, I don't know if I felt that when I was there the last time. Actually, I was there two, probably three or four times. Uh, but but for that time I saw those those uh, footprints and those tracks when they going down there, it kind of spooked me because those tracks are very intimidating because there's something big and large down there that walked it and. Uh, I didn't know if I really wanted to go down there. It's snow, uh, you know, it slows me down. I tried to walk through thick snow to get there. So, um, but yeah, but uh, I, I definitely have not returned to that spot. Um, huh. So now I, I go up to, uh, when I research here, I just go up to Bailey. Bailey's our big hot spot. Up there. I just went out to Wellington Lake this past weekend where they have a cluster of sightings. Of, and that's where finding Bigfoot's come out to. Um, then there's some research up there. Um, we have a town hall meeting coming up in October out there. I'm not going to be at. And, uh, and there's been uh, uh, apparently a hundred different people out there having issues uh, with oh. sponsors up there. Yeah, so we're going to be up there in October to listen to the community and, and what's going on, and especially that woman who was in the uh, store that day and wanting uh, someone to come up there and put cameras out and uh, see what's going on in her property. Because she said it's, it's getting really intense. It's happening every night. Um, so we're going to we'll see what's going on up there um, over over the next uh, couple of few months. Oh wow! What well, do do you take anything you know for protection when you uh, mm-hmm. go on these investigations? Yeah, all we do is we just take bear spray, and we'll take a two million volt laser. So we always take because I'm not out there to hurt, really hurt them or or kill them just to deter them. So if something was to come at me, that bear spray is pretty, I mean, it's pretty gnarly. Stuff. So um, it would definitely deter them from coming at you or any other animal out there. Coming at you. Well, I never take a gun or a rifle because I don't want them to see me as a hunter. Mm-hmm. So I don't take guns out there. Well, and everything anybody- else that I have is concealed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, has anybody ever tried to trap one, or have you ever thought about trying to trap one? No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not out there to do that either. I mean, even though science has offered ten million dollars to bring one to them, I don't care. Uh-huh. Money. It's, it's, I just want. I, I'm in it for the research. I'm in it for mm-hmm. the species. You know. Um. I, I'm not. I'm not out there trying to take them from their home. You know. I'm just trying to understand them and 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 bring it. Bring it to science. You know. But, uh, you know, they don't have to hide anymore. You know, I'm trying to, I mean, but the thing is, is it's very hard because you have people out there who are trying to hurt them. They've had all these years of seeing people hunt and, and seeing the things that we heard out there in the woods. You know, it's going to be very hard to bring these, just to, you know, like, like uh, people do with gorillas. It takes them a long time to get gorillas to, to come to you and trust you. To get a Sasquatch to start trusting humans, it's going to take a lot of time. A lot of effort to even try uh, to get that to happen. So there's got to be some type of Bigfoot whisperer out there somewhere who can actually talk to these things to get them to understand that, hey, look, we're not here to hurt you. We're just here to understand you like you're here to understand us. And that somewhere down the line we are related, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, But, no, I'm definitely not out there to hurt them. I don't want them to know that they are even think that I'm an honor of any kind when I go up there. But uh, I would definitely like to see them brought to science. And so, like, if someone's walking in the woods and say, hey, there's a fairy, hey, there's a soft spot, hey, wow, you know? Um, so, so that's really where I'm at on that. Well, how do you separate uh, reports from legitimate claims of sightings of a Bigfoot from the hoaxes? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when you talk to somebody, and you're talking about a Sasquatch encounter, you're talking about a sighting, you're trying to get them to describe these things to you on um, what they saw, and, and especially in the area that where they saw them at, uh, because before you even go there, you've already 
research what's in the area, what's been the true sightings that have been there, and the, the true reports that have come out, and the evidence that has been collected in the area before you even go out and talk to this person, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we go out there and talk to this person. We were talking to them about the encounter, that we were talking about what they saw and what had happened. You know, um, and, and describe you know these things to you, and if they're they're giving us something totally different than what's been in this area for the last who knows how many years, um, especially with the true researchers that are out there researching the area, and they're giving us some 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 stuff that doesn't isn't consistent with what's in the area, and they're most likely they're, they're telling you a bunch of bull, you know, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know we're just most most likely uh, you know if we can't find anything. That matches anything that they say out here, then most likely they're just a bunch of bulls and, and we we'll just uh, pass them on. You know, uh, and tell them we can't help them. You know? And sometimes we'll bring up some of the things that are in the area, you know, and say that, that uh, whatever you're telling us is uh, not what's been out here. You know, it's not what people are seeing out here, what the research out here is, it's nothing like it. You know, uh, but then the ones who are telling you the truth, you know, they know exactly what they're seeing out there and it matches the things that we found in the area over the last. You know, you know, for five years or more, um, in an area that's stuff plus it seems to move. They seem to migrate to different places. It's like we move from house to house, they seem to do the same thing. Like we'll see a Sasquatch, um, you know, for a few years, and you go back there, and you won't see it anymore. Maybe if they left the area, or you find uh, a different, uh, a different family there of Sasquatches, you know. Um, but they tend to move, and all the fires that go on out here, they tend to move and migrate different places. Um, but, uh, but you know, out here, and I've only came across, I think, one guy over the last 10 years, maybe, maybe two guys, maybe it was one guy, I mean, this man. You know, that was feeding me a line of, line of crap about the, uh, a sighting that he had had. Um, but, uh, you know, I think because he found out that, uh, and a few years back, he found out the tiny Bigfoot was coming out, and he decided that he wanted to to tell his encounter about what he had, what he had saw, you know, and he wanted to get on the uh, get on the show. So he was so much of BS. Mm -hmm. Well, how are out here you... too? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, well, I was just wondering out here. Uh, I don't. I was talking here talking. Uh, right. I was just trying to see out here. I was just trying to see out here. A few years ago, we had a big, massive fire out here, uh -huh. and uh, we had like five different forest fires going on. And the squatches after the fires were over were seen in the city itself. They were coming down into the city because they had no food, no no nothing, no no food sources. The water had all charcoaled over, uh, and so now they were coming down into parts of the the, the, the city. And going through people's trash cans and the big uh, dumpsters and things like that, uh, scavenging for things to eat and, and, and stuff to drink after all these fires that, that happened down here. You know, which is something that this area has never, I've never heard of before, they're coming into the city park to get uh, food because there was nothing to eat and all the animal life was either dead or it ran off. Um, and we believe that there's a possibility that uh, uh, some of the Sasquatches out there may have been killed during these fires. Anyway, I just wanted to just throw that in there. Uh, they did come out here to the city because they have gotten photographs of these things in the trash cans. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, they don't blame them. They're hungry, so they want something to eat. You made me think of something uh, that I that I read a while, well, a long time ago. Uh, after Mount St. Helens uh, exploded, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, there was reports that the uh, Army was pulling bodies out a Bigfoot and taking them yeah. away. Do you know anything yeah. about that? Yeah, that was the Army Corps engineers were, were doing stuff like that. Um, actually, there's a there is a Mount St. Helens Bigfoot that was from Ape Canyon uh, down there, and uh, they got a photograph of that one after the explosions. But yeah, I've, I've heard, I don't know if it's true or not, because of course we don't see them do it, but that's been reported for many years that the uh, that the Army Corps of Engineers had, had taken these uh, Sasquatch bodies um, and had uh, put them in bags and taken them to wherever they took them. Yeah, I've heard that for, for a long, long, long time, and, and no one's really proven it to, to, to uh, 
be true or not, but uh, we have seen pictures of uh, the squatches down in Mount Saint Helens. Wow, so we know they're down there. They're still down there today. Cape Canyon is still getting sightings there. Wow, why are there so many encounters or sightings in the Pacific Northwest? I mean, you look at uh, look at um, uh, British Columbia, and we believe that they've migrated down from British Columbia into the United States, down into uh, you know Washington and Oregon, um, over you know the last couple thousand years. Um, just like up in uh, when they started getting sightings up in New York, you know they came down from Canada up in the northern uh, west part of. Uh, New York and in the Canada border by Niagara Falls, uh, that they started to migrate down there too. Um, but you know, as the forest gets, uh, you know, as, as they find, you know, because they really don't see what we see because they can't watch television and they can't see maps and they can't see the things that we see where you should live at, you know. But uh, as you know, the Bigfoot population gets bigger and more Bigfoots, you know, come into an area. They start to move on, you know, like families do. They'll still start to move on, and as they keep moving on, or they go more southward, or wherever they're going from the time from British Columbia, they just found their way. They kept following the forest, and they kept found their way, you know, down up into the American Northwest, and, uh, Oregon, and uh, 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 Washington, and California. You know, they, they kept on um, migrating over over the years because of the more sausages that are made and the more babies they make. The more families that are being made out there, they have to keep moving because you're not going to find normally no more than four squatches in a family. Um, and, and then the adolescents, they go on on their own, just like lions do. And they'll, when they get to a certain age, they move on and find their families and make their own families. And things just keep getting bigger and bigger, just like we do. we got to keep moving because we get overpopulated. So they start to get overpopulated, so they got to move. So they work their way all the way up. You know, out in Valley seem to work their way all the way you know, all over the world now, but uh, but it, it's just overpopulation. Well, has anyone tried to estimate the population of of Bigfoot? Well, you know what, uh, that is something that someone did. I think tried to do it one time. Uh, what they did is based it on all the sightings that were around the world. And if you're and if you're looking at so we have a population what uh, one point something billion people here in the United States and you take the sightings of Sasquatches uh, and some math I'm not a mathematician or nothing like that but we're looking at just the United States alone just here uh, probably could be about eight hundred thousand in the United States alone so that's a lot in the United States over the world you're probably it could probably be, you know, over a million all the way around the world. Okay. So that's a lot of squatches. Yeah, that's a lot. Well, what's your, opinion, yeah. what's your opinion about the Patterson uh, Bigfoot footage? Do you think it's a hoax or do you think it was real? No. I think it's real. Yeah, that, that, oops. That's one. Sorry. Like I said, that's what got me started in all this when I was a kid. Um, that's, you know, besides me being there filming it myself, um, that is something I believe is totally real. And I've looked at that film over and over and over again. And there's nothing in that film, especially back in that time, that would tell me that that was some type of makeup artist doing something like that. Because this thing can walk so fluently in that creek bed the way that it does in a suit, or even being in some type of a um, it was makeup, it would be extremely hot, extremely difficult to walk in that kind of condition in Bluff Creek. You know, I've been down the Bluff Creek, and you just can't do that. You know, walking in. I mean, I, I have this Bigfoot suit that I have. I have to have five Bigfoot suits. Well, I put on a Bigfoot suit just here. Where, where we go squatching that, and I try to, I can't get five feet without falling, right? I mean, you just can't. And you could just think of walk the way that it did, fluently that it, that it, that it could, through this creek and, and, and over the rocks and over the over all these broken down trees and branches, 
<clears throat> without, you know, skipping a step. You know, there's no way a human could do that on their best day. They're even doing it in, without a suit, you know? And the, how, the the broadness of the thing, how big it was, you know? And and why would it would be a female? Why would someone think about doing a female and not a male, right? Give the thing breast, you know? And and then you can see the uh, bulges of the muscles coming out of the leg. You can't you can't do that in a suit. You know you can't do that uh, even putting someone in makeup. You just can't do that. You know it, it's this thing that's humongously big. If you look at it, it had to weigh at least uh, 500 pounds or more. You know it had to be at least eight feet tall. There's just no way that you, know, you can put someone in that situation at that in that creek and do the things that this thing did to walk the way that it walked. And a fluently that it walked. And and uh, it's just it just took so so when I watched this film and I said, Man, I know this thing is real. And, you know, there's nothing in here telling me that it's fake. And uh and that's the the, the one uh, besides the excuse me, besides the um that brain fight here for a second. Um oh my gosh. Uh James uh oh shit, hey man. I got myself all screwed up. Paul Freeman, I'm sorry. Brain stuff. But the Paul Freeman film was a pretty good one, too. Between that one, if you look at this watching the Paul Freeman film, it looks to be about the same size as the one that was in Bluff Creek in the Patterson Dinner. But the, the one that the uh, Paul Freeman film was a, a male and the other one was a female, but they looked to be similar. Um, and his footage was pretty, you know, distinctive, too. Um, but I believe his footage is also real. But those are actually the two that I've that I've seen over time that look the swatches look alike. And, you know, they're just people are just not taking stuff like that. That's the way that you know the, the way that the filming went and, and, and the spontaneousness that it was of it. And he only had a minute left of his film when he when he took it. Um it's just it, it, it's just a phenomenal piece of footage. You know, I talked to Dr. Jeff Meldrum too and his studies on it and uh, and he he feels the same way I do. He believes that it's just actual authentic footage of a of a Sasquatch. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but that, I'm saying that's what got me started in this whole this whole thing of uh, research with that piece of footage. Oh no, it's fascinating. I've watched it over and over and over, and and seen where so many different people have tried to break it down. You know, part, like you was talking about the muscles expanding and contracting. No. And, yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, because the, 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 I mean, you have to look at the, the way that the muscles are when it moves, the, 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 the tone of its arms, its legs, its butt, its back, its shoulders, when it moves, you can see everything moving in the mm-hmm. muscles while it's walking, you know, and that you just can't fake that. Um, but uh, it was a very, very, I mean, there's no man that big to be put in a suit like that anyway. Or even that, I mean, there's just no man that was that big. I thought, you know, that's, that's humongous. That's like, that's like a, to me, it would be like a giant to me, you know, this giant, like King Kong looking thing, you know, it's, it was, it was huge. Right. There's no man was that size. There's some people that size. A woman, you know, not that size. It was, it was a phenomenal piece of footage, and it's always going to be. You know, and that's a true piece of footage. I agree. Well, when you uh, go and speak to these eyewitnesses, what's what's the best questions you know uh, that you ask uh, uh, to uh, get a feel of well, one, if they're being honest or not. Well, first, I like to know what it, what it is that they saw, what it looked like. All right, even the size that that it, you believe it was, you know, or the color it was. Um, and then, uh, um, like, uh, like where they saw it at, uh, how fast it was moving, if it was really slow, it was standing up, it was squatching down. Uh, did you see the front of it? Did you see the back of it? Um, things like that, you know, so you have an idea of what, you know, what it is that they saw. Um, but that's a person that you can, you can do with a person who's 50 is just get the, um, uh, the structure of what this thing, you know, what it is that they saw. Um, and then if they come out with, you know, something that we believe that could be a Sasquatch, you know, then, then fantastic. Now we take them and ask them, you know, 
you know, where it is that they saw it at, they can take us there and then uh, the location of the place. And then we'll look at the area that uh, they saw it at and then we'll figure out what it is that, you know, what a white was in this area. You know, was it a food source? Was it looking for something, you know, in like in human nature? Was it out trying to get water? Was it just out just taking a walk? Um, and where they were at and uh, what they were doing at the time that they saw it. Uh, so maybe it was observing them. Um, you know, but, uh, but mainly you can first just ask a person what it looks like. Most people, if they've, if they've never seen a swatch up close, they're not really going to get a good, you know, description of what, what it really looked like you know, and how big it was. You know, um, but that's the first thing you want to look at is the description. So they get the area that they're at. We know the descriptions of the sauce watches. Yeah, they can well, something totally different than either it's something new in the area or they're full of crap. Mm -hmm. Well, I know it's like the two I've seen. I, I could only describe what I've seen in the face. I mean, I, 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 they were covered in black fur or hair, but you know, I, I just really didn't pay no attention to anything else. I just was too damn scared to, to break the eye contact. Because yeah, I wanted, I guess in my mind, I was reading to make sure, hey, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm backing away, you know, and, and that shock and that fear, it, it, it's overpowering. And for me to be able to tell you exactly and describe uh, the physical characteristics, I, I couldn't tell you. I, I, I can just tell you the eyes and the face. Yeah, because, you know, that's what a lot of people look at, too, when they, when they've seen a squatch. It's their uh -huh. face that they're looking at, you know, because that's what I do, too. Like, if I see one, because they all have different types of faces. And, but mm -hmm. if I see one, I like to see its face because that tells me, that can pretty much tell you the different species by looking at the face. Um, so that's what I like to look at. And But uh, a lot of people will not actually get, you know, unless, because you, first of all, you're shocked. And you're, you're just looking at this thing. That you don't want to look at anything else but its face because you don't want, uh, you know, you don't want it to start charging at you without you don't know about it. So you don't want to take your eyes off of their face. Right. Um, some people are just afraid to even move, even look at anything else on a swatch. Um, yeah. You know, now now Todd Standing said that he was attacked by one. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, you never heard about that? Uh-uh. Yeah, yeah, he said he was attacked by a swatch squatch. And, uh, and he told him, you know, trying to tell people what you do if you're attacked by a swatch squatch. And uh, I don't know, it was kind of funny, but, but he said, that uh, actually what happened with him is he was walking out in the, in the forest. He actually stumbled over it. It was laying down, and he walked right over it. And when he did that, he fell on the ground, and this thing stood up real quick and looked at him, and then it had grabbed him and, and uh, pulled him up, and then it threw him back down to the ground. And Todd said, if you get attacked by these soft squashes, don't look at it. If they start eating anything, that you can get your hands on, whether it be, you know, a, a, a piece of twig or a leaf. Well, he said what he did is that he started eating dirt. And this thing looked at it, and he, and he would knock the dirt out of his hand. Like, don't eat it. You know, like, that's nasty stuff. You don't eat dirt. But Todd did. He said, he grabbed, I grabbed the dirt again, and I started eating the dirt, and it smacked it out of my hand again. You know? And then when he said he started picking up a leaf and eating a leaf, the thing kind of calmed down because he said that you don't want to show them any type of aggression. So what you do is you sit there and you start eating, you know, and what that does, it seems to calm them down. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, that's, how, that's what he did. And the, the sauce squatch within a, a couple of minutes, he ended up walking away. He just sat and started eating leaves. Oh, wow. But if, he, but if he ate dirt, it would knock it out of his hands and he didn't have to eat dirt. And that's why she's not eating dirt and they didn't like it. Was I, would never, I would have never thought of nothing like yeah. that. Yeah, see, and, and, too, and then there's also some other things out there is that people who say that they've been abducted by sauce squatch, right? Well, uh -huh. apparently, people who've been abducted by sauce squatch, what the sauce squatch wants to do, and this is what 
the theory was, or theory is, and, and the stories that people would tell you is that they, the male Sasquatch, the dominant male, would go out and he would abduct a, a boy or a man, and he would bring this, them back to their camp where they're, that they're at. And what it would want to do is it would want the, the human male to have <clears throat> to mate with their adolescent female that was coming to age, and that's what it was for. Mm-hmm. That's why they abduct humans, not to kill them or hurt them, but for them to mate with their with their um, adolescent females. So oh, wow. that's just something that that's going out there. Well, It'd be really so hard I, I don't to know make if, <laughs> that situation. Well, I, I don't know if if uh, I don't know about that one, but that's just something that's come across my my attention o- over the last few years. You know, um, I, I don't even know if um, I mean, even if that was possible, even if someone did, we would even make another Sasquatch baby or not, because our our genes have changed over the years. And I don't even know if they're close enough now. To even to breed, to be able to to be compatible with uh, Sasquatch as humans and Sasquatch. I don't know. But that's what people are saying. The ones that uh, have come across that uh, they were uh, the stories of themselves. I'd be like, I have to have a little blue pill for this. I can't. I can't work on it. There's just some crazy stuff out there, you know. Like people are saying. <clears throat> So, you know, but some of the stuff I just take with a grain of salt. You know, but people, you know, they, they'll tell you all kinds of things. You know. um, um, see. So I'm looking at some of my notes uh, that we've been looking at. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the different, um, so I have, uh, so, see now, the, the Sasquatch, when it, it has these ape-like traits, right? Uh-huh. So, and so, of course, they can't use fire. They have lots of fire users and stuff like that. And they're very limited. They don't use any type of tools but what nature gives them. You know, they have that lack of sclera in the eye, you know, um, and they have that the metatarsal hinge in the foot. They have a, a sagittal crest in the chest. I mean, at the chest of the uh, of the of the brow, the of the nose and the eye, you know. And then and then some of the human traits that they they have. They have a few. They have like uh, bipedalism. They have possible language. They can also mimic our language, um, and uh, they have a more of a like an advanced social structure than most primates out there. So they have, they do know how to um, make a home more or less. You know? mm-hmm. uh, because they'll, they'll manipulate the forest and, and make it uh, a pretty comfortable place to live in. You know, so they can, if they can survive uh, in the forest for all these years, so they have a very bad social structure for it. Okay. Um, but like I said, until science gets and analyzes their DNA, it's really going to be impossible to answer the question you know, whether they're ape or some sort of relic common. Um, but uh, because the DNA that 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 they said that they got 2009 is still under question, um, because we don't know if that is 100% correct. I mean that's still in debate. Um, now Melba Ketchum, she was a prominent uh, veterinarian out in Texas. Um, she did a lot of research and stuff. But uh, and so we want to know 100%. So we actually need to know that a Sasquatch is sitting right here. Hey, look, we got a sample from you. You know it was a soft watch. And that way, when you run the DNA, whatever it comes out at, at that point, then we know it's 100% correct. Because mm-hmm. people that are just finding samples out in the forest, claiming it to be a, a, a big blood hair or a big blood tissue or, or blood, scat, whatever they, they come, up, come up with, is just hearsay until we can sit a soft watch down or tranquilize one or whatever just for a second just to get a sample of blood. Say, hey, look, now we can 100% figure out what you are. Mm-hmm. But no, one's had, no one has yet to do that. So we, we, we're really not 100% part of that. So, um, but uh, 
until that day comes, you know, we're just, you know, um, we're probably about 50% sure what they really are, and, and but we're, we're just not all the way there yet. And like I said, until we actually can know that we've got a sample from an actual crosswatch, there's just really no way to you know 100% for sure. Yeah. So it's all going to be guessing. All going to be theories and speculation. Right. Well, do researchers like yourself and other cryptozoologists, do you all get together and compare notes? Yeah, see, that's what we're doing now. So that's why I got the SFRT. SFRT is a national and actually worldwide now uh, research organization where we all share all of the information that we collect from different parts of the United States, Canada, Ireland, Australia, Russia, uh, different places, and what they do is that whatever research that they come across, any new research they come across, uh, any new type of evidence or any type of sightings, any type of species that might be, um, any type of samples that they, they come across, we, we all, that comes into our organization. And and then once we get, uh, well, once I get that information, and then what I do is I get those samples that come in, I'll go ahead and I'll have them test DNA testing uh, just to see what they are. Um, and then if any films, any footage come in, um, then we'll take that and we'll, we'll archive that and we'll, we'll learn from that from like maybe, you know, uh, like if we come across something like down the road, we can always put something together from what we found from the past. And it's all about putting a piece of the puzzle, to, uh, of these puzzles together, you know. And so that's really what we're doing. We're building a puzzle on, on these squatches. And hopefully, without actually having the body itself or expressing itself, that maybe we can come to where, say, you know, another 50 years from now, we're comfortable in saying with everything that we've collected, up, basically is what it is. It's all of the circumstantial evidence that we have collected over the last 100 years. We are safe to say now today that we know what a soft squash, squash is, and we believe this is what it is. And there's not and there's not another you know hundred theories out there and what they think these things are, you know. So when you get a whole bunch of people together, you get a whole big organization together, and you get all these researchers out there doing their doing their research and they're, they're investigating and collecting and observing, you know, and you get all this stuff. You put everything into a big old pile, you know, and you keep doing that, and then the more we do that, the bigger the picture we're going to get down the road. And so what we're doing, we're just modeling, you know, what this thing may be. And uh, so everyone does a, does a lot of good work out there and sharing a lot of their information. So we have people out there that do things live on, on, on our on, in our network, and they go out there every day and they film live and and they, and they share less information with us on what they found the week before, what's different this week, um, um, and then they share that information with us. And also too, I have uh, you know I have a lot of people on the travel channel who send me some information. You know, I, I check, um, um, like Dan Gerhard, you know, uh, he you know shares his information with us also, um, and and he comes across you know a lot of good stuff. He thinks he puts it in his books, and, and and what it is is that for a network of people, we've got to put a big, big picture together, circumstantial evidence, until the day we come across the specimens that we actually can get DNA from. So. But I think if that never happens, and we never do get a talk to us, at least we're going to have all the circumstantial evidence, put enough of it together to determine what this thing really is. So that's what we're going to have to conclude, you know, uh, once, if, if, if and ever our research ever comes to an end, you know, down the road, because we figured that we've done all we can do without actually having a specimen, and we'll find out... Uh, so I'll probably be about 80% sure of what we're doing somewhere down the line. Mm-hmm. Well, y'all uh, don't have any, y'all don't have any infighting like the paranormal world does. No. No. That's good. Oh, no, really? That's good, because I know my, my field, oh, it, it is such drama. Well, yeah, here, I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying. I mean, I mean, every every now and again, you'll come across what we call an idiot in the field, you know. Um, so other than that, I mean, everyone's pretty consistent in what they do. Um, there's normally everyone gets along. Uh, everyone shares information. 
uh, because of most of you know most of the research is out there. Again, it's just you're in it for the species. And but you know this is a big enigma right now. There's, I mean, look at the paranormal field over the years. You know, we we pretty much we have pretty much to this day proven that ghosts exist. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. Now, Sasquatch is a whole different thing. You know, we know that there's some big bipedal, you know, um, you know, primate or whatever it is out here walking in these forests. You know, but we just don't know exactly what it is. Even though we've gotten footage of it, we've gotten film of it, science still will not believe it. They believe that something's out there, but they just don't believe what it is. They don't, they don't right. believe in, in, in the actual Bigfoot itself, but they believe in the tracks, which really don't make any sense because it's, these things are leaving the tracks, but a lot of them think that, I don't, I don't know why science likes to think that a lot of these are hoax, you know, but they're not. Some mm-hmm. are, but but most of them are not. But like I said, they still want to stress it. But we, you know, the particular world is pretty, it's pretty, you know, relaxed. We do, and no one bothers anyone. You know, as in uh, bad mouthing people. And stuff like that. Um, everyone's interested in what the other person's learned. And that's really all it is: learning from the other person. Uh, everyone keeps learning, and and because that's basically what this is going to be, it's it's a learning process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it, it's, it's taken 50 years just to get behavior-wise and what these things do. You know, we're just at that behavior point of it. You know, we're still trying to figure out the structure of it, you know, right. uh, and exactly what it is. You know, right now we're just in the behavior part of what they do. You know, so I can't sit down and talk to them. So I, I, I don't know. All I can mm-hmm. tell you is what we're observing, what we're finding. And we try to put things together, kind of like you know, they need like a, a, a psychologist for Sasquatches or a, a forensic uh, profile for a Sasquatch. You know, by huh. taking all of its behavior, put that into a model, you know, so we can understand it better. You know, maybe right. they can understand. It. I, I've never seen a <laughs> seen a uh, Sasquatch profile, like you did. <laughs> but that would be something interesting. Well, yeah. Well, does the Bible say anything about the possibility of a Sasquatch? No, nothing that I've seen. They say stuff about dinosaurs, you know, but I've never really seen anything in the Bible about Sasquatch. Okay. Well, has anybody found any fossil remains that could possibly be a a, a Bigfoot? Absolutely not. No one has. It's too big. Um, I mean, but look at look at, look at here's the thing too about you have someone say say you're out in the woods right and you're walking along and and you you, you found someone to get a drink of water and you look down and, and you see this whatever you know piece of bone or whatever kind of like sticking out of the ground mm-hmm. and uh, you, you you take this bone. And it could be just a small piece of bone or it could be a big big piece of bone. And you take this bone, you know, and you bag it up and just curious to know what it is. Um, and you take it down and, and you try to have it tested to see what kind of, you know, kind of bone this is. Okay, so say if it was a Sasquatch bone, you know, well, first of all, I mean, it would probably be you know, a big bone, but there are people, you know, who have big bones. Um, but if you take it down, you have it tested, you know, and if they're, and if they're human, if they have human bones, because their bones are, are like human bones by the way that they're structured, um, then the possibility, again, it's just going to come back to human bones. Um, so I don't even know if, unless we get a full skeleton of mm-hmm. a sauce bus that could do dinosaurs, I don't know if we really 100% know if it was in our thought box, but I just wondered even two bones, three bones. I think you still need basically a, a whole skeleton or at least, a, at least the top part of the skeleton, you know, like from the close up. I think we can figure out it was a, a it could be a soft watch type of uh, uh, skeletal remains or, or fossils. And stuff. <laughs> but I think a few bones just weren't going to do it. We're going to definitely need a lot more. To find that 
Well, what's the strangest or weirdest case that you've ever investigated? Strangest or weirdest case I've ever investigated. About 12 years ago, I was in Utah. <clears throat> and this is a place where, you know, where we were at, you know, this is another another thing that like like people are talking about the UFO and and the Bigfoot connection type of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And this is another thing out in Utah where um, uh, there's uh, under Utah they have this place where we're at. It's, it's part it was like part desert, part I don't know, kind of kind of like forest, but but they were seeing this thing that they were they were seeing something coming out of this rock face of on the side of this hill, and this uh, uh, Indian who was out there, and what he would do, he'd go out there and he would look for um, um, these uh, uh, what do you call these things? Uh, this type of like horse crystals and things like that. Yeah. He'd be out there looking, and he'd always be in a certain area where where he would find these uh, certain uh, uh, rocks. And he said that he would always see. Uh, this thing, what he would call this thing at the time, of uh, coming in and out of this rock face. But what he said was, but but it's not like a cave. It was, he said actually it was the actual rock itself. And we didn't, I didn't really, what do, you, what do you mean it's coming out of a rock? He goes, yes, it comes out of a rock. And so we had him, I had a look at this, this rock that he was, that he was talking about. And it was like a solid, big, humongous boulder. I mean, it had to be, you know, at least, uh, gosh, I don't know, big as, uh, maybe as big as a, like a house, a five-bedroom house. That's how big this rock is. Um, and it's a solid rock. There's nothing, you know, that goes behind it. There's nothing all underneath it. Uh, the rock doesn't open anywhere. But he swears that every time he comes out here, that somewhere in this rock, he would see this thing walking on this rock. And then he says, when I walk through it, I watch it. It disappears into the rock, and, and we just—I just couldn't copy what he was trying to tell me. I mean, you, you can't go through a solid rock like that. Well, he says, "Yes." Yeah. He says, "This thing, the standard, it will watch me." And he says, "And then I would watch it." And then he says, "And then it would turn around and it would walk in and go through the rock." So I didn't know he was talking about a bigfoot, but he said it looks like a—it was a—it was a bigfoot. It was a a big hairy man, or hairy man, what they call it, and but it was going in and out of that rock, and, and so we went out there actually with some paranormal equipment, and we had <clears throat> took some EMF uh, readings around this rock, and this rock got some high EMF readings. Well, this rock, come to, come to find out, it was made out of uh, uh, pure limestone, and you know limestone seems to have a lot of energy anyway. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but when we got this reading, we got like a 20 to 25 milligauss reading off this rock. And anywhere on that rock that you would go around it, you would get this, this big EMF reading. And so then I started thinking, well, this, you know, uh, it's got a lot of high EMF. And I'm saying it's because it's limestone. But anyway, <laughs> we decided one night we were going to go ahead and we are going to head just, just, we thought it was kind of crazy. You know, but we're just going to set up some equipment. We're going to put some cameras up this rock. We're just going to look there and watch it film. And uh, so we set up this uh, camera, and we're watching this rock. Now, the weird thing about this thing was is that at about uh, 2.30 in the morning, on the footage, you see this shadow emerge from the left side of this rock, walk around to the right side of the rock, disappear on the other side, on the back side of this rock. But it wasn't it wasn't like a solid figure, it was just like a, a, a shadow type figure. But it was a pretty big shadow figure. Uh and it was the craziest thing I've ever saw. You know, and so we showed the old man, you know, uh, the footage from, from that night and we, he says, Yeah, he says, That's what I saw, but it stands there. It's it's it it he says it I don't know, it, it forms into you know, like a skinwalker type thing, it, it just forms into a solid he says a solid hairy man. Uh-huh. And then it goes turns and it goes back into the rock. But we only thing about we had caught that night, but we caught this shadow 
come out of the rock and move pretty fast around the rock and into the other side. So we're figuring that this is either some type of portal that this rock was opening that was inside the rock, and we don't know exactly what was coming out of the rock, but but it was one of the, some of the craziest footage that I ever got on a Sasquatch investigation. Wow. It's just come out, actually come out of the rock, and it's just jarred, it like jarred. It was, it was about nine or ten feet tall, and run, I mean, ran fast around the rock to the other side and just disappeared. And we don't know exactly what that was, but he says, but if you hear it during the day, he says, you'll see it. He says, it'll come out and it'll be there and it'll look at you, and then it'll turn and it'll go back into the rock. So the next day, we went ahead and we set up some cameras and we tried to look at it during the day, but we never caught anything during the day. It was only mm-hmm. at night where we caught this shadow figure come out of that rock. Actually, on footage, come out of that rock. And he was right. Something did come out of that rock. It, it went right back into the rock, but it, it, it made a, uh, you know, a turn around to the other side of the rock and went in. And But we went back up in that rock and we just examined that rock and kept looking at this rock and, you know, and it, it, the rock was actually solid, but we don't know what was coming out of that rock and back into that rock. But it was one of the strangest things I've ever saw uh, when someone claiming it to be a big foot up on the rocks. Oh, wow. Yeah, but I, I just don't know what that was. To this day, I don't even know, don't even know what that was. Dang. There's some weird <laughs> stuff to see. <laughs> There's weird stuff all over our planet. Oh, my gosh. That, that's that's awesome. Well, at least you call something. Uh, I mean, that, that yeah. kind of very, that was yeah. what he's saying. That that was, something. That was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, though. I've, I, I've seen something just come out. I mean, just it was. I mean, just looking at it now, it just it just came out, then it left, and went right around the rock, back into the other side, and disappeared. It only did it once. Wow! Greatest thing I ever saw. You know. And it only lasted for about five seconds on the camera. Wow. It was, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting to see, I was for sure. Um, but, yeah, that was one of the strangest things I've ever really uh, seen on a, on a But uh, they, But they're, they're also trying to say it was some type of, uh, because they also saw UFOs over there, too. You know, in that same area, that the old man would report UFOs. And um, he would see these uh uh, these little uh, uh, ships and these little saucers that, you know, fly into that area and just disappear. Uh, but we never did investigate the UFOs. We were just there for anomaly of like spots that we said that we saw very bad. It was. Um, would you, we, you know, could have been UFO related. Well, do you think that know. UFOs have anything to do with Bigfoot? Because I know I've I've read a lot that uh, a lot of people say they've seen UFOs and then seen a Bigfoot you know, not long after. Yeah, you know, that's something. Another thing I'm going to be uh, looking at here over the next couple of years, uh, actually, I have a, uh, I have a, um, a place that I'm going to go out to in New Mexico where there's been incidents of a uh, UFO reports with the National Sasquatch. But this is a different kind of Sasquatch now. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, half, it's, half, it's like half Sasquatch and Half, half horse or half goat or half something. Oh, wow. Yeah, seeing them. yeah they, they got photographs of the UFOs and then they got photographs of the uh, new Sasquatch looking thing. You know? And mm-hmm. it's weird because it's uh, half Sasquatch and half goat. Oh, wow. People are really scared. Yeah, it's all different. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is right in the same mountain area that these UFOs are flying in and out of. And they said uh, this this thing had emerged uh, about two weeks after uh, they started seeing these uh, UFO sightings. And now this oh, wow. creature has uh, emerged up there. It's new cryptid. And now uh, this is the first I've ever heard of a half Sasquatch, half sheep, or half goat, or half whatever it was. But it had four legs in it, too, but it had a Sasquatch top. Mm-hmm. And the chest, the arms, and the head. But the bottom was nothing like a Sasquatch. It's like a goat. Wow. Yeah, well, John, that's going to be a new one on me. Yeah, me too. I've never heard of that one. But I'm just about out of time. we got about five minutes left. So uh, uh, I'll go ahead. 
I, I'd like to have you back on some uh, sometime because I didn't even get to talk about uh, you know get in, uh, get into the paranormal so much. But uh, what what's your plans for the rest of 2019? You know, do you have any I'll other? I'll tell you. Yes. Oh, let me see what's going on next thing. All right. Okay. So next month I'm going out. Next month I'll be out filming with the Travel Channel. Um, and then starting in the spring, I have some things going on. I can't talk too much about it right now, but uh, I'll be doing some stuff with Discovery Channel out in Africa. And um, and then I'll be back uh, into the States. And then my book, Squatch Files, will probably be coming a TV series. That's in the works right now in the creative stage of getting that work done. Um, well, let's see here. Uh, what else have? Uh, oh, yeah, I have a lot of stuff I'm doing down here locally uh, with uh, Sox Bucks Outpost and they're filming um, uh, the movie Backwards, which I'll be involved in with that. Um, so, yeah, I got, I got quite, quite a few things going on out here still. Well, I don't know. Um, like I'm saying, like radio shows, like I've done so many radio shows uh, um, over the years is that I'm going to have to slow down doing radio shows because I've got to transition to doing these TV shows. Uh, right. During the break times of these TV shows that are going to be going on, um, I will um, probably come back and do some radio shows. Um, but so let me give you a hint. Let me give you a hint on what I'm doing. Um, most likely, we'll be doing in the spring is that I'm going to be uh, researching dinosaurs out there. Oh wow! So yeah, out in the Cameroons are back. So I'll probably be out there for a few months. Um, doing that, and um, then I'll be back, and I'll be doing cryptids and other unexplained things in the United States. Uh, but hopefully, once Watch Files is ready to, to go and and uh, become a TV series, um, it's, it's instead of being being UFO based, it's going to be cryptid based and finding the truth about cryptids. And so that's that's what we're working on doing, and that's that's in the, the creative stage and in the, in the filming process right now. Um, so we will we will see uh, how that comes about. Uh, but yeah, but I got, I got some things going on, you know. So um, I, I will. Uh, um, you'll see where I'm at um, you know, during these stages of what I'm going to be doing. Because I'm going to try and do is that uh, once I get these things start to film, such as Squatch Files, and I like to bring my team and not just my team but other researchers that are out there, try to get them into some parts of the series of, of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so they can, you know, be part of uh, be part of it because, uh, um, you know, because I have another book coming out, you know, another part of American Soft Spots coming out, and then I also got the uh, the Bigfoot Saga book coming out. But the American Soft Spots next series of books is going to be about all the researchers who want recognition of the things that they do out there in the field. Ones that already mm-hmm. talked about it aren't even known. And I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a lot of these people into the book. And I got GQ magazine coming out in November. Squatch GQ magazine is actually what it is, and it's going to be like a, a, a more low point of uh, Squatch magazine, to where um, people are going to be less afraid of, of Bigfoot, you know. So mm-hmm. Bigfoot's kind of in swag. He's in swag. He'll fit in swag, and he'll be you know in, mm-hmm. in wearing swag clothes and his sunglasses and. Um, Things like that, you know, so it'll be more kid based so they're not afraid of them. Uh, and then we'll be posting a lot of things in that. And I got interviews from a lot of people uh, going into that, a lot of research photos and stories and things going into the magazine. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of different things are going on. Awesome. Well, if uh, people want to get a copy of your uh, books, uh, how can they uh, get a copy of your books? And also, how can people get in contact with you if they've got any questions, thoughts, or any okay. sightings to talk to you about? Yeah, just what they do is that they can just go to my website. It has everything on my website up there. It'll have a report, uh, a sighting on there, or it can have contact me or contact us. Um, all my books are on there, too. There's a direct link to, to get my books. And that's at uh, Squatch, which is S-G-U-A-T-C-H-X-Files.com. Okay. Squatchxfiles.com, and you can uh, see all the stuff that I do on there, all the stuff that uh, our researchers do. There's a lot of videos on there, books on there. There's uh, sighting reports on there, and, and there's a place to report your sightings. Um, and and uh, if they want to do that, they can be more than happy to look at all all the stuff we got. I got some stuff on there with Bobo and 
some point of this book, and I've got uh, uh, some of our top standings information on there, some of the film and research that we've done. And uh, I got some stuff on there that our researchers have done, and uh, if they want to look at that, uh, it, it should be quite interesting to see what we got going on on that. But yeah, anything they want to do with me, just go to that website. You can, you can find me, find my books, contact me. And, uh, and uh, I'll get back to them uh, hopefully as soon as I can. You know, I get a lot of people who you know, send me a lot of information, so sometimes it takes me a second to, to get to you, but I will get to you. Okay, John. Well, John, I do appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, it, it, it's been great talking to you and learning so much uh, about this topic because I've always been fascinated with Bigfoot, so even with what I've encountered. And uh, yeah, there's a lot uh, more stuff to talk about. Bigfoot. Yeah, Bigfoot's always going to be a discussion. But there's just so much stuff to talk about. Oh yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, John, like I said, I, again, I appreciate it. We'll work out something when you're not so busy. Come back maybe sometime next year and. And tell us what now is going on, and maybe go uh, more into the paranormal too, because uh, I was wanting to get you know your take on that. But uh, yeah, I'll let I you just go. got back from New York, you know. So yeah, because I just did a trip in New York. I like to talk to you about too. So oh, okay, great. Uh, Hudson Valley, I bet. Huh? Was it the Hudson Valley? Because I've heard and read that there's a lot of Bigfoot activity in that area. Yeah, well, it was a paranormal investigation I did, but on the way back, I, I did some uh, uh, did some uh, looking around Lake Erie and places like that. And, cool. um, went into Pennsylvania and Ohio and uh, places, you know, just some interesting stuff. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, but I'll let you go. And again, thank you for, you know, coming on and spending time with us and talking about uh, your, your work and uh uh, you take care of yourself, and uh, we'll work something out for next year. And uh, have a good night and a great weekend. <laughs> All right, Rodney. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you, sir. You have a good night. All right, you too, man. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for us tonight, everyone. I, I, I want to thank John for coming on the show. Like I said, I have nothing but respect for him and the jobs that he's doing. Uh, we'll try to get him back next year after uh, uh, he, he does all his filming and all his other work that he's doing. Uh, but for next Thursday night, August 29th, our special guest will be mystic, visionary, alchemist, clairvoyant, energy healing, empath, artist, poet, spiritual. This woman's got a lot of titles. Let's just put it that way. Uh, Silva Gaza. I, I know I told her name up and I apologize. I'll get it right by next week. So uh, there again, that's it for us tonight. You all have a great weekend. Um, have a good night. Nothing but love. Now let me see if I can get this, this off here so I can actually play my end of the show. Let's see. I think I did. Oh, okay. I found it. Y'all have a good one. That's it for us tonight. I want to thank everyone that took the time to listen in. I'd like to give a big shout out to the Vibe Radio Network and to Ryan for putting up with us. Also to all the first responders and our men and women in the armed services. Thank you for your service and the sacrifices that you and your families make every day to keep our great nation safe. Tune in next week to another exciting show starting at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Everyone can go to our Facebook page within the chaos and don't forget to like our page uh, to see upcoming guests along with past shows, postings, or you can also go to uh, my website at www.blackdiamondps.org or blogtalkradio.com forward slash vibe radio network. Also, we have a YouTube channel, so go to YouTube, look up Within the Chaos for past shows. Thanks again. Until next week, everyone have a safe weekend and have a good night. And love you all. Be careful out there.
I'm sorry. But I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children. Victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers! Don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, or what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. Only the unloved hate. The unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite!